Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. As believers in Messiah Yeshua, we should live with a kingdom consciousness. Now, what does that mean? Every decision we make, every action we take, all things in our life need to be done and decided based upon the reality of the kingdom of God. I mention as believers in Messiah. Well, one of the ways that we can understand that term Messiah is King Messiah. He is the king in this eternal kingdom. This life, so says the book of James, is but a vapor. In relationship to eternity, however long you may live, this life is here today, gone tomorrow. So why would we make decisions? Why would we emphasize that which is of little consequence? No, we should take whatever days that we have and live them out with a recognition. How I behave today, it's not so important about how it's going to impact my life in this world, because this world's coming to an end. It is limited. It is temporary. But the kingdom of God, it is forever and ever. Therefore, I want to be wise. I want to make decisions. I want to do things that is going to impact my eternity and not this temporal world that we live in currently that we're going to depart probably much sooner than you think. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 33. Now, I mentioned that there is a tendency among most of those who provide commentary on the Bible for them to see this passage as relating to Assyria, that the enemy, the victory is over Assyria. And as I shared with you last week, I set that perspective aside. Why? Because when I look here, I see many clues within the text that would cause us to have a kingdom perspective. He writes about things that have a kingdom connection, not a worldly connection. So this scripture, it deals with God's salvation him saving his covenant people over the enemy, and the consequence, the outcome of that, is a kingdom reality, the establishment of the kingdom of God. In fact, I would suggest to you that the primary thing that we read about in the Scripture is the kingdom of God. That's why God does what he does so that we will be ready for that kingdom and that we will be recipients of God's goodness, his blessings, his promises, that we will have the full measure for eternity. That's God's desire. But ask yourself a question. Is that your desire? Now, many of the commentators, they come with a very liberal perspective. And what is one of the the results of having such a perspective? They read something, and they want to put it in the past rather than in the future. Something that's already been fulfilled rather than something that is yet to be fulfilled. And many of these individuals, they don't have the emphasis. They do not demonstrate a commitment to the reality 
that God has promised to establish a kingdom. So let's begin where we left off last week, the book of Isaiah chapter 33, and we're going to begin in verse 13. So we're going to complete, God willing, we'll complete this 33rd chapter, and we want to pay close attention to all the clues that Isaiah gives us. All these things that he was inspired to write down in order that we can grasp God's revelation to us. So let's begin. Verse 13, he says, listen or hear. Again, this is a word that demands a response. God's not just speaking among himself or to the heavens. He wants us to receive this revelation and respond to it appropriately, correctly. So he says, listen, and then he has a word for far away. And obviously, he's speaking about far away places and primarily those people who are far away. He says, listen, those who are far away, to what I have done. And know those who are close, my might. So there's a relationship here between what God has done and his might, his power. And it's because of God's might that he's done this. Now, in many people's mind, when we look at this, we see that that in the Hebrew language, biblically speaking, there is a, a very common tendency to put things either in the future or in the past. And many times the past is used only for the purpose of describing something in its entirety. Sometimes the past is used to describe a future event, but to show that this event is assured. It is going to happen. And I would suggest to you that's exactly what God is saying here when he says, what I have done. He's talking about two things. He's talking about this defeat as he's already prophesied of the enemies of Israel. Israel being brought into a redemptive relationship and therefore experiencing as a consequence of redemption, victory. God has already done that work of redemption. And now he says to those far away and those who are near. Some of the commentators, they see those who are far away, those of the Gentiles. Those who are close, we're talking about the children of Israel. And when we deal with what God's going to do in the last days, it has implications for all of humanity. God, as we know, is not a respecter of people, meaning he doesn't have his favorites. God has called Israel in a unique way to serve him so that God's message, his purposes are made known to all the people of the earth. So he says, listen, those who are far away, what to what I have done, and know those who are near my power. And then notice the next verse, verse 14. He says two important things here. It begins with a word for those who are afraid, those who are experiencing great fear. And who is that? Well, those who are sinners in Zion, Zion. And what it's saying here is this. God in his kingdom, he is not going to tolerate sin. Sin in the kingdom of God, and I believe we're speaking about the millennial kingdom, under the administration of Messiah Yeshua, sin will be dealt with quickly. God will not give during this millennial kingdom long periods for for repentance, that the long suffering of God will be manifested, not so in the kingdom of God, this millennial kingdom. In the New Jerusalem, there will not be sin. But in the millennial kingdom, there will be. 
And what he says here is that those who are in Zion, and this is oftentimes a, a word that relates to the kingdom, specifically the millennial kingdom, those who are in Zion who are sinners, they should be afraid. And, and fear, and this is a word for trembling or shaking, has seized who? Those who are hypocrites. So we see a correlation between those who are sinful, those who are hypocrites, says one thing, but behave differently, that, that God is going to behave in his administration of the kingdom so that those who are sinful, they're going to be afraid, and those that are hypocritical, they are going to be shaking. They're going to be trembling because of God's righteous rule. He says at the end of this 14th verse, he asks a couple questions. He says, who is he that will dwell with us? And then he has this term, a devouring fire. Now, devouring fire speaks of God's judgment. And again, it's related to him not tolerating sin and destroying those things that are of sin. So he says, who will live, dwell, reside, the word yagur, who will dwell with us? And with us might be a reference to the triune God, to the heavenly host with God, however you feel led to interpret this. But who will dwell with us in this midst of this fire that's devouring? He says again, same term, who will dwell with us? And then we have this, this fire, this burning, it's a different word, and it deals with burning places that are forever, eternal burning places. Now, what it simply speaks about is that God is going to consume all those things that are not of his kingdom character those things that are in conflict with it. So he asks the question twice, who's going to dwell with us and personally? In the same way that we see in the book of Genesis, let us make man in our image, I believe it's a reference to the Trinity. Can I prove that? No. Those who believe it refers to the heavenly host or the, the presence of those who are in, in the heavens, perhaps but I see it relating to the Trinity. And then he says in verse 15, he answers the questions. Who is going to be the one who dwells with us? He says, the one who walks righteously and who speaks uprightly. And by the way, the word righteously is in the plural, and the word upright is also in the plural. So those who walk in righteous deeds and those who speak those things that are upright. And then he says something else. Keep reading. It's a word moes. Moes is a word for loathing something. Now, it's just not, I don't want this. I don't like it. It's a much stronger term. The one who loathes, and what does he loathe? Profit. That, that was achieved or received by oppression. And again, the word oppression is in the, the plural, so by oppressive activities. What should one do? Well, we have the word for, for moving one's hand. And this would be a gesture to say, no, this is not for me. I'm rejecting it. And therefore, the one who shakes his hand to, to support a, a bribe, meaning this. Someone says, here, I'm offering you this amount of money to do this. And what this verse is saying is that one would shake his hand because he's not going to be supportive. He's not going to be part of any activity that is derived, that's an outcome of bribery. He is going to close his Ears, and this is a word for actually sealing them. So it's sealing something shut. In this case, his ears from hearing 
about bloodshed. Any plan, any action that is going to bring about the shedding of blood, and he's going to close his eyes from seeing any evil. Now, what it's saying here is this. The one who's going to be in the kingdom of God are those individuals that are committed to righteousness, the things which are upright, that are not going to be led to behave in a way that that is for their profit, receiving a bride to, to, to pervert justice and righteousness. Those who are going to use their power to oppress others for profit. No, those who are going to be in the kingdom of God, those things that are evil, those things that are in conflict with God, we don't want to have any part of whatsoever. We don't want to be privy to those things. Now, of course, we stand against them, but that they have no place in our existence. That's what verse 15 is saying. Now, verse 16. God is speaking about what are the benefits of such a person? dwelling in the kingdom of God. He says, he is is high up. He will dwell in the upper places in the fortress of the rocks is his exalted place. So we use two words here. The word for being lifted up and that which is of, of a high, high location these two words. And so it's a place of safety. It's a place of exaltation. It's a place of God, God manifesting his pleasure. And also with God's pleasure comes God's provision because his, his bread, his sustenance is given and his waters, they are faithful. And this means that what he needs for existence, bread and water, is going to be provided in a faithful, consistent manner. So there's no fear. There's no threat. You are above any type of harm, and God is going to provide faithfully, consistently for you. That's the outcome of those who have a kingdom experience. So it gives us a peace of mind, a joy, a contentment, a, a, a feeling of security. And this is what God's promising. He says, look at verse 17, a king, and this would be Messiah, a king in his, his beauty. Your eyes will, will perceive or see. Now, it's a word for having a vision. And some would say, well, vision's like a dream. No, it's not. A vision is what God gives to one, and a vision is very precise. God's vision gives us clarity to what God wants to reveal to us. So we need to remember that. So this one is going to see a king in his beauty, He is going to look upon this one with his eyes and see the land that is far away. Now, what this is speaking about, this land that's far away, well, land is also, land of Israel, has a kingdom connection. And what it's saying here is this that we're going to perceive, see, experience. Sometimes the word seen is an experiential word. You see it because it's the reality. And even though this kingdom, this land of of God's uh, eternal dwelling place may be far away currently, we should have a vision of it, a perspective for it. Verse 18. Verse 18 is going to deal with a change. Now, it's in the future because he's speaking to those who are, if you look at one interpretation, remember we talked about how many see this having to do with Assyria. So those whose heart is fearful because they're hearing about Assyria coming, this massive empire. I will point out to you that prophetically, Many times the Antichrist 
is, is spoken of as the king of the north, and the king of the north is parallel to Assyria. So it may have a dual purpose, but it says in verse 18, your heart was, was meditating. And this is a word for paying great, great attention to something. So one's heart, that means your thought, was, was fixed, meditating upon this, this fear, this, this dread. But what's going to be the outcome? He says, where is the, the scribe? Where is the one who weighs? Where is the one who counts towers? Now, what's he referring to here? Well, he's speaking about, most commentators see, the first time when he says, where is the scribe? These are ones that write things down, that are going to take note of this. The other time when it says weighs things, this has to do with a counselor. And the third one, it's also the word so fair, but it speaks of those who are counting. And the counting of towers was for the purpose of knowing how strong a, a city was. So these were the ones who would take consideration, battle, war was coming, and they were fearful. And therefore, they began to act to see what they were up against. And what God is saying is, because he's going to fight the battle, we'll say, where is this one? He's not there. God does not. God does not scope out the enemy to see who he's up against. It doesn't matter to God. That's what this passage is saying. Those who have feared in the past, those who are fearful about the future need not be because God's got this under control. With God is none of those people who are taking down information that may be helpful in some later battle. There's no one that, that is weighing, that is giving counsel on what to do, what not to do. God doesn't need counsel. He does as he pleases. And God carries out his objectives. And it doesn't matter how many towers the enemy has. They are no match for God. This is what it's being said. Verse 19. And the, the bold people says, you will not see. These ones who are bold or, or brash, those ones who, another way that we can understand this word is those who are fierce. So it's speaking about an enemy. And he's saying those who are fierce, bold, brash, that set themselves against us, he says, you won't see. And a people that have uh, a deep speech, and this means things that are, are hard to understand. Their speech is not easily grasped. Nor, he goes on to say, that these who have a deep speech, which is difficult to understand, and those who have a tongue that, that stammers. So whether they're talking about an enemy that is kind of a barbarian, doesn't even communicate well, or those who are of great intelligence. It simply doesn't matter. God never sighs up. He never uh, pays attention to who the enemy is because nothing is difficult for God. So we're not going to even see the enemy. This enemy has no, notice how it ends this verse, verse 19, and be not, which means there is no understanding. This enemy does not understand who he is up against. This one is prideful. Pride produces foolish activity in one's life, and that's what these opponents are doing. They are opposing Almighty God. They are standing in opposition to the will of God. The will of God, in the end, it will be achieved. It is foolish. It is going to bring about despair, it is going to bring about eternal destruction for those who set themselves up 
against the things of God. And that's why we read, look at verse 20. It says, and in Sion, this is the city of, of the kingdom. It's a reference for a kingdom experience. And it says, Sion will, will have a vision of the city of his appointed times, his festivals. So Sion is going to see that, that city of the festivals. Now, we're speaking about Sion is parallel to Jerusalem. And what we're being taught is this, how important for understanding kingdom reality are the festivals, the biblical festivals. Now, you know who knows that very well? The Apostle Paul. Why do I say that? Because if you look sometime at Colossians chapter 2, he tells us, that that these things such as the festivals and Shabbat and Kashrut, that is the kosher laws and such, new moon festivals, all these things. So we're talking about the festivals here. Every festival, Paul says, it is a shadow of things which are to come. Many times people say, why, why don't you like the New International Version? Well, one reason why I don't like the New International Version, the NIV, is because it's not a literal translation. It is done by those who have an agenda, and instead of translating things literally and accurately, they translate things very, very loosely in order to support their preconceived perspective. That's one. Secondly, that it is a translation that is deceitful. In that passage from Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, where it says that these things, like Shabbat, the new moon festivals, the dietary laws, and the festivals, says all of these are a shadow of things which are to come. NIV says which were to come. It doesn't say which were to come says which are to come. And the, the substance that casts this shadow is Messiah. Now, what's coming? It's a kingdom. And what gives us the perspective for the kingdom? Messiah does, of course. But what the scripture tells us is the more that I understand these individual festivals, the more I'm going to better understand, first, Yeshua himself, and secondly, the kingdom that Yeshua will establish. And this is the same thing we see in verse 20. It says, Sion will, will gaze upon the city of our festivals. And your eyes will see Jerusalem. And what's Jerusalem? Here again, this is in the future. It's a kingdom prophecy. Jerusalem is going to be a oasis of stillness or quietness. And it says a tent that, that cannot be, be moved, one that will not travel. And then it says whose pegs, and these are the pegs that, that you, you drive in a, a tent court to, to hold it up. It says and will not travel its tent cords forever. And all of its, its, its cords, so you have the pegs, now you have the cords. All of its ropes, it says, will not be severed. This is the same word for, for example, in modern Hebrew, when you're disconnected in a phone call, you use this phrase. So it's disconnect or sever. That's not going to happen. God's kingdom that he speaks of as a tent here is one that's going to be, as the scripture says, le netz, le netz, netzach. netzach is forever. Now move to verse 21. For since there, and that's literally what it says, 
Now, some Bibles, there's the expression ki im in Hebrew. Usually, ki im means rather. But that's when there's a line that connects them. There's a line here, but it doesn't connect ki im, but rather ki stands alone, and the word im stands with the word there, sham. So the rightly, right way to understand this, and the word im, it can mean if sometimes, but it can also mean since or because of. So for since there is the mighty Lord. That's why this, this kingdom is eternal. This is why things don't change or move or disconnect it, because the mighty God is there for us. It's a place of rivers, and it's the second word for rivers, but this is a, a bigger and a stronger river. And then we have the word rachave yadayim. This means wide. And it's in the plural to say that these rivers, these streams, they are massive. Now, a massive river is also going to have a very strong current. The bigger the river, usually the harder it is to cross it. Not simply because of distance, but because of the power of that current within the river. So he says here, it's, it's wide, and one will not go upon it in a, a sailboat, or even in a mighty, and this would be like a naval uh, group of ships. It will not, what? They will not uh, uh, pass over it. So what it's saying is that, that God's city, his kingdom, is not going to be approachable by the enemy. They're not going to be strong enough in order to even bring an attack against it. It's simply a poetic expression using terms in order to cause us to understand the safety that we do not need to fear anything in the kingdom of God. Now, someone will say, now, wait. In the millennial kingdom, there's going to be those that go out. Satan's going to be released. Yes, he is. After a thousand years, Satan's going to be released. He is going to deceive many that are born in that millennial kingdom during those thousand years. They're going to go out, and they're going to want to come back. But they're not coming back because fire is going to consume them. So the message is that God's kingdom is totally defensible. It will not be breached by the enemy. That's the message here. Now let's press on to verse 22. For the Lord, he is our judge. The Lord, he is the one who makes law. The Lord is our king, and he is our savior. Now, those things being put together are so important. God judges us. He judges us by what? His statutes, his laws that he's put forth. For he is the king, but he's also our savior. So he's judge. He's the lawgiver. He is the king, and he is savior. He takes all of these things upon himself. Verse 23. Now we're speaking about how the enemy is not going to be successful. Those things that are left to the natural has no longevity. They are going to fail. Look at verse 23. He says, your, your, and this is the same word for cords or ropes, will be abandoned and they will not be strong. Thus, and it's talking about, again, a reference to a boat. And on a boat, if you go on a course at this time, there was only one type of boat, those that used the wind. So they had these sails, 
And with these cells were much ropes, and the cells were attached to what's called a mask, a large pole. And he's saying here that the enemy that's going to come, well, they're not going to be successful because their ropes are going to be abandoned. They will not be strong. And thus, the mask is not going to be able to to be spread out upon the pole. And what's going to happen? The enemy is going to be very, very weak and not able to attack. And because of that, they'll be defeated. Why do I say that? Look at the second part of verse 23. Then will be will be plundered until until the the plunder. Now the word here, first word, is word to be divided up. So we could say, and then shall be divided until the plunder. And there's going to be much plunder, it says. And even, notice this. Even the one who's lame, he is going to, to uh, uh, take spoils. He's going to fight and take spoils, much spoils, from the enemy. Now, what God is saying is this. Even the one who is not appropriate for physical battle, like one who is lame, but this one, through him in a kingdom reality, this one, even he, is going to take great plunder and spoil from the enemy. And all of this, if a, a lame person could go and take great spoil, just think about what that speaks about the enemy and how unable he is to defend himself. So God is using many ways to speak about how the enemy is going to be defeated and how the people of God are going to enjoy a kingdom experience. Verse 24. Verse 24 tells us a great promise of the kingdom reality. Now, here's the problem, and we're going to close with this verse, obviously the last verse in this chapter. But I want us to deal with one thought, and that is this. There are many people who teach theology, whether they are a leader of a congregation, whether they are a Bible teacher, whatever. They might be the leader of a small congregation of 30, 40 people. But regardless, whoever they are, many have the wrong view. And this is the mistake they make. They take the kingdom promises, the reality that what we're going to experience in the kingdom, and they think that's what we should experience now. Much of the air of this prosperity gospel is that they take a kingdom reality and they want to place that into their current reality in this sinful world This world of disease, this world of sin, this world of violence, this world of ungodliness. We may not experience in this age, this life, the promises of God. But in the kingdom of God, we will. It speaks nothing of the unfaithfulness of God. God is absolutely faithful. And he's promised us that we, like his son, will be rejected, hated, and suffer in this world. And he says, count it all for joy when you're persecuted because of your faith. But let's conclude. Look at verse 24. He says, now who's speaking? Well, we have the word shechen. Usually, shechen, when we hear this, we think of a neighbor. But it's simply the word for dwelling. So it's one who dwells. And it says, the one who dwells, let him not say, I am sick. Now, people will will apply that today. And someone will say, you know, I'm not feeling good. I'm, I'm coming down with something. I'm sick. People say, oh, don't say that because out of your mouth, that creates a reality. That is ridiculous. You're sick, you're sick. That's the reality of the situation. 
Because I say something, this is again a false teaching. So here it's talking about the kingdom reality, and it says, let not the one who dwells. Now it's in the 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 uh, uh, noun, so it's one who dwells, the dweller. Let him not say that that I am sick, and the people that dwell in it dwell where? Dwell in Zion. Let them not say these things. Why? Because they are the one who dwells in it, dwells in Zion. What are they? Look at the last two words, the words, nesu avon. The word nesu, in its normal form, it means to lift something up. But in this form, it's in the passive, it means for, for something to be lifted, usually lifted or removed from someone. And the last word in the text is the word avon, which is iniquity. So we see something. We see both sickness and sin not being a reality in the kingdom of God. But we still live in a world of sin. Let us not sin. We still live in a world of death and we Unless we survive until Messiah returns to gather up his congregation at the time of that blessed hope, the rapture, we, I can assure you, you will die because we're living in a world stained with sin and you have been stained with sin, original sin. But in the kingdom of God, one will not experience sickness, and one will not experience death. Why? Because we are going to experience the full outcome of having sin removed. So again, when we look at this 33rd chapter, I see great reason to understand when we look at the prophetic clues, what is stated here, that it speaks about a kingdom establishment. Not looking past in the days of Assyria when they invaded the northern kingdom and also came to Judah, but rather it speaks about the last days and teaches us about the wonderful promises that we can expect to experience in the kingdom of God. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.